Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dana Joya. 20 years ago, when I was the newly appointed chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, I found myself at a dinner party in Virginia, uh, hosted by a very prominent neoconservative, uh, in which the other guests were very interesting people. Andrew Sullivan was there, but most interestingly, Newt Gingrich was there. He had just uh, triumphantly, you know, uh, won, essentially led the, the, the charge to win both houses of Congress. The, there was a Republican president in office, and he was announcing to the table that he had created a permanent conservative revolution in the United States, that he was doing things now that would essentially create conservative politics, you know, for the next few generations. Uh, it was a boastful thing to say, and, but I think you know, he had a certain right to be proud. I mean, he had done something that was remarkable in political circles. Uh, but, but I told him that I felt that if you look at changing American culture by doing tax policy and regulations and legislative uh, reforms, that it was ephemeral. It could be easily overturned by the next Congress, which indeed it was. But that the real issue was to change and revitalize and reform the culture. That the stories that, uh, that people see in films or read in books, uh, the values that are reflected in poems and songs and artwork, these are the things which, in a sense, change people's lives. And as people's lives and values change, they change the system around them. Uh, this led to an argument uh, that we had, which I found rather was cordial, but it was a serious argument. And uh, all I'll say is that 20 years later, we can see how permanent that legislative revolution was. That the issues that we face are the issues of culture which is to say all of humanity, of the imagination, of creativity. And that's why it is my enormous pleasure to have a conversation this afternoon with James Matthew Wilson, who is, to my uh, judgment, one of the two or three most important uh, creative Catholic, younger uh, creative Catholic uh, intellectuals and artists in the United States. I met James fleetingly at Notre Dame about 20 years ago, told him about a conference that, that I was co-directing, which was the largest poetry conference in the United States. Uh, he came and he was invited to uh, read a lecture, and that's when I noticed him. I was in the audience, and suddenly there was this graduate student from Notre Dame who was smarter, uh, more learned, and I think more charming uh, than all of the chaired professors uh, that we had. And I told my co-director, I said, we got to get this guy here every year. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, James and I, it was the beginning of a long association. He has done remarkable things. It would take too long, really, to talk about them all. Uh, he is the Cullen Foundation uh, you know, chair of English at the University of St. Thomas in Houston. The position is not what makes it interesting. Uh, James, uh, ha at his age, has not only produced five children, uh, but 12 books. Um, to do those simultaneously, I think, is a remarkable thing uh, and a great testament to his wife. Uh, he's done six books of poetry and six books of prose. Uh, he is an intellectual of capacious reach and true learning, but also uh, an ability uh, to bring things ac that are complex across clearly. As a poet, he, I think, is the foremost in his generation at reviving what I think of as the deep Catholic tradition. Uh, you know, most recently, if those of you who have, uh, have listened to uh, uh, Frank LaRocca's Mass for the Americas, one of the sections is a setting of James's uh, poetry. Do you have that book here? This is a remarkable book of his that, you know, uh, you, you may know, The River of the Immaculate Conception that uh, came out. And so uh, I'm going to talk to James about some of these issues. But let, let's talk about 
history first. If you go back 100 years ago, 120 years ago, Catholics were uh, a poor, marginalized group in the United States. It was a large group, but they were largely poor immigrants. They had very little cultural influence. In the mid-century, they suddenly entered intellectual life and cultural life, but it now seems that at the beginning of the 21st century, we're sort of back where our grandparents and our great-grandparents were. That you know, Catholics are a kind of marginalized uh, minority that has very little cultural or intellectual influence. Is that right? It is, and, but there's a little bit of a wrinkle to it, and that's at the turn of the century, when we think about the presence of Catholics in the United States, we think mostly of immigrants in the inner city, and, uh, and that's still a familiar image. But there's, there's an aspect of Catholic presence in the United States at the turn of the 20th century that's actually worth studying as we look at our present moment. And that's the, um, what you might call the sort of medieval revival that passed through the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. You've heard some of the, the language, uh, Carlyle's idea of uh, industrialists as captains of industry. He was trying to gin up, um, you know, owning a factory does not make it a little more adventurous and exciting than, than it often feels day to day. Uh, but there were other aspects of late Victorian and early 20th century culture that also tried to give a dramatic face or appearance to what people feared was an increasingly banal materialistic society. So uh, Dana mentions our meeting at Notre Dame years ago. It was always one of my pleasures to walk through downtown South Bend. Not a lot of people say that, but I, <laughs> uh, I always took a great pleasure. And one of the pleasures was to pass by these um, Protestant churches that were all done in a neo-Gothic style. And each of those churches with its neo-Gothic architecture is an instance of Americans worried that they have somehow failed to build up a culture worth loving. And so they turned to the one culture that they knew was worth loving, and that was the, the Catholic culture of, of European Christendom. And so uh, that led to, to a sort of efflorescence of culture in architecture, first in ecclesial architecture, then as um, uh, those of you who know Princeton University and Yale University, in academic architecture, the collegiate Gothic style, uh, and around the margins, we could, we could point to uh, other instances where Dante and Catholic Europe, the Catholic Europe of the Middle Ages, is being brought back to life in this desiccated Protestant culture in order to give that culture some life. So while that's not Catholics having influence in American culture, it is Catholicism shaping a culture. And this is more than a historical footnote or an architectural footnote. Had these things not happened, what occurred a mere 40, 50 years later in the middle of the 20th century probably couldn't have occurred. And what happened then? Well, Catholics began to migrate to the suburbs, but also Catholic intellectuals, philosophers, theologians, popular priests, and, um, and dearest to my heart, of course, authors began to have a public voice in American culture. Now, Dana, you're going to have to remind me how many uh, National Book Awards were won by Catholics in, in a 10-year period? I think it was the National Books and Pulitzer Prizes. I think it was 11, uh, you know, that were in a short period of time. I mean, American literature at mid-century was startlingly Catholic literature. One of, one of the moments uh, that where this was brought home to me is um, uh, one of the most controversial professors at Harvard at the turn of the 20th century was George Santayana, who was not himself uh, a theist, but considered himself a Catholic. And he enjoyed, enjoyed scandalizing all the, um, the young upright Protestants of Harvard with his Catholic aestheticism. Well, that it was only a matter of time before people looked at the things that Santayana was, was saying and was recommending to them. They say, Santayana shows us that these things are beautiful and they're good. What if they're also true? And this led to the conversion of many people. 
uh, including in American culture, one of the greatest of the mid-century or early 20th century American poets, Wallace Stevens, but also the young um, poet of Boston Brahmin ancestry, Robert Lowell. And when Robert Lowell published his first book of poems, uh, The Land of Unlikeness, Santayana, who was an old retired man living actually in a convent in Rome, um, got a copy of this book and he read Lowell's poems and he said, this is the future of American poetry and the future of American poetry is Catholic. Well, that raises the question though, is that American Catholics have never been better educated uh, never been more powerful in terms of the economy and politics, never more affluent, and yet uh, seemingly never more distant from the church or from the, the, the cultural concerns of the church. What happened? Well, I mean, the 60s happened, but it's one thing, but um, I, I actually don't see the present moment quite that way, Dana. I, when I look at uh, where we are intellectually as a church in the United States, what I see is about 20 years of brilliant scholarship in both philosophy and theology, akin to what occurred in, within the church in the early 20th century with the Neo-Thomist revival. The Neo-Thomist revival and that re renewal of the intellectual life within the church, I think, did lead uh, quite directly to the eventual appearance of a in the best sense, a cultural Catholicism, as but, in Catholicism, cultural but, influence. Uh, my sons went to uh, Gonzaga Prep in Washington, and it's a building of a certain generation, and it's, I, th I think of it as fortress Catholicism. It, it, it was built at a moment when the Protestants could have at any moment, it, you know, come and burn, burned mm -hmm. it down, and mm -hmm. so it looks like a building that was meant to be defended. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me what we're seeing right now is very much of a, of a revival of fortress Catholicism, that we have these wonderful, powerful things happening, but in a kind of of a, a cloistered or a defended space, yep. and we've lost our ability to engage the general culture. Yes. And nowhere more so than in culture. I mean, uh, yes, there's a, I mean, you can have wonderful neo Thomist revival, mm -hmm. but if it, this is not going to reach your children, this right. is not going to reach your grandchildren, this is not going right. to enter the classrooms. And, right. and that's what, it gets, you know, what I'm concern, you know, concerned about, and I know you are too, yeah. Yeah. is that. What do we need to do, and what would it look like uh, to revive the cultural conversation mm -hmm. of ca Catholicism? We're not talking about the legal system, right. we're not talking about this, right. but the life of imagination in the United States. The U.S. is the most creative country in human history. There's mm -hmm. dozens of arts simultaneously practiced, and yet the Catholic voice seems rather mute in most of them. That's certainly the case. There we, we agree. What I, the analogy I want to draw is that the Thomist revival was an instance of fortress Catholicism, but it led to the writing of several good novels, including Flannery O'Connor's. At our moment, I think there's a, there is a risk of a kind of insularity, intellectual and otherwise, within the church. But I do think that there's been a great intellectual fruitfulness within philosophy and theology that primes the church in its intellectual culture for the kind of renewal that I think you were calling for in your, uh, your book, The Catholic Writer, today. And I think at this moment, uh, I, I wanna use that word again, primed. We're, we're at a moment that is primed to see a vital intellectual life begin to give birth again to a renewed artistic culture. But the, at the root of your question is, what is that going to look like? And here's yet another reason why I was hoping to have this conversation with you here today, is that several things that are uh, exemplary or aspects of your own career, I think are things that are going to be necessary for uh, Catholic writers and artists if they're to have any significant presence in American culture again. I'll just label a few, I don't wanna flatter you too much, but, um, but just, first of all, your, um, your call in the 19, early 1980s for the restoration of attention to form and craft in the art, um, that's one. Two, your call for the artistic and the cultural life to get off the university campus and back into the daily life of, Amer of American cities and towns and 
that's exemplified. Churches. And churches. <laughs> and three, your sense that, um, that the arts are, in some sense, well, in multiple senses, are public. That they're a concern of all Americans, regardless of education. If we were to truly embrace those three principles, I think we would see a great proliferation in the American arts in general, and specifically the arts of the Catholic Church. Well, you know, if I die, it's unlikely I'll be put up for canonization, uh, but if a week after I die, all of the music in Catholic parishes suddenly is good, you can count that the first miracle. <laughs> uh, see, I, see, James, you and I share a devotion to the work of Jacques Maritain, and I, it, this is something I think that's, that's at the at the heart of the problem of Catholic culture. Uh, if you were fielding sports teams based on academic disciplines, the Catholics could always have, you know, win the division championship in philosophy and in theology, because we're tremendously skilled at abstract thinking. But most people, most of the time, in most of their lives, don't think logically. They don't experience the world mm -hmm. rationally. They don't experience it conceptually. They experience it holistically, simultaneously, as, as images, as emotions, as memories, as mm -hmm. intuitions. That is the language of art. And I think this is where we have the failing. We, this mm -hmm. was the glory of Catholicism. We had music. We had painting, we had the sensuousness of sculpture, of, of poetry. Mm -hmm. Even European, modern European drama begins as church drama. Mm -hmm. And we have, one by one, lost not simply our primacy in those arts, but our active participation. What would, what would it seem to you, let's, let's take music. Uh, you have recently been involved in one of the most interesting you know, projects of sacred music. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're lucky right now to to be alive in a moment where we have Morton Lauridsen, one of the greatest sacred composers who's ever lived alive. Uh, over in England, we have James Macmillan, and now in America, you know, we have you know, Frank LaRocca mm -hmm. uh, reviving liturgical music. Talk about that experience. That's, I could talk about it personally, but also just generally. And personally, of course, I've been able to hear the premiere of several of Frank's compositions, including the Mass of the Americas and the Requiem Mass for the Homeless, and, um, and they're deeply transformative works of art. What I think is most of, most of the greatest moment here is that these commissions that Frank has been doing are not for a symphony that can be performed at a symphony hall. They're for masses, and, and think in particular of the Requiem Mass for the Homeless, where the forgotten of the streets were being invited into mass where the music had been composed specifically for them. And actually, for those who were present at St. Mary's Cathedral when the Mass of the Americas was first said, they all would have borne witness to the long uh, Cruzada Guadalupana, the long, um, uh, excuse me, pilgrimage that uh, Latin American citizens in, of, of uh, San Francisco had made across the city to the cathedral, and then they entered St. Mary's Cathedral on their knees and crossed the floor of the cathedral on their knees until they fell in prayer before an image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And it was when they arrived there that the mass and the music began. So this is a restoration of a kind of, in a, in a very rich sense, of a sacramental art form where the, the music and the mass itself is being, is incarnating the spiritual life of a people and not just a selection of the people or a class of people, but the life of the whole church. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect example. The image of Our Lady of Guadalupe is more powerful than any theologian. Uh, it's written in the last 500 years. You know, it has spoken to hundreds of millions of Latin Americans, mm -hmm. you know, about being called into the church. In the same way that, uh, you know, Morton Lordson constantly gets letters from people saying, I was driving on the New Jersey Turnpike at two in the morning, I was depressed, your music came off, I pulled over to the side of the road and I realized I had lost my connection with God. Hmm. Music, art, literature has an ability to cut through and speak directly to somebody 
all the conceptual, analytical things out of the way. And that is, I think, the great strength of the church. How people don't, I think for the most part, come to God through intellectual argumentation. There's probably 1% of people that do that. The other 99%, it's intuitive, it's emotional, it's experiential. And, and I think we have to give them, even in just the narratives, mm -hmm. that this is something that might happen to you. Uh, in poetry and in literature, uh, you have done something that's really quite remarkable. You and Joshua Wren have created a Masters of, of Fine Arts program, an MFA in literature at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, which provides faithful Catholics with a very disciplined way of developing them, themselves as a writer. What do you think the, the, uh, the goal of this is? What, what is your hope that this becomes? Well, it's, it's several fold. I, I never had any desire to start another graduate program, but over the years, uh, I received so many notes from young people who were graduating from good liberal arts colleges who wanted to pursue the intellectual life and who wanted to pursue the literary life, and they were writing to ask me for a recommendation of where they could go. And I, it was a very short list. I often sent them away empty, depending on what field they were interested in studying. It never occurred to me that I would just throw away the idea of giving recommendations and just start my own program. But I'm so glad that we did, because for every person who has come to this program, the students who have enrolled have said the same things that Joshua Wren and I were thinking when we first conceived of this program, which was we wanted to do the artistic and the intellectual life the way it was meant to be done, but so seldom is in our day. So our, our aim is to build up a generation of artists and critics who are capable of doing two things. Producing great works of art that anybody and everybody ought to pay attention to, but also to produce a generation of genuine critics, people who can interpret works and can spread the audience for literature and the other arts beyond the, the small provinces into which they have shriveled in the last few decades. We, we tend to underestimate the role that critics play, but I think it's a, it's an indication of the poverty of our contemporary literary world that we actually have very few good critics. Um, people need, people seldom try out a new work. They, t they seldom look with care at something new unless they've been given a reason to do so first. And so we want uh, to be fulfilling both of those aims within the program. Yeah, an another way of putting it, because I think people hear the word criticism and it, you know, and they say, well, that's for something else. Huh. Your life, in a lot of ways, your intellectual life, your creative life, consists of having an experience. You see a film, you read a book, and what's the most natural thing is to then have a conversation about it. Because, you know, ask what somebody else thought about it, ask what someone else's experience were. And uh, as Christians, as Catholics, we are called into community. You know, I personally would prefer in some ways just to pray by myself and be by myself, but I'm am asked to go and sit in pews next to other people who I might not socialize with otherwise and to understand um, their importance and to love them. And that is really transformative. And I think what you're doing is calling creative artists, calling writers into community so they understand that no one exists alone. We exist in relationship to each other. And to not only have the creativity happen, but then foster the conversation. If a Catholic publishes a really good book right now, who will review it? Who will talk about it? Who will give them the constructive criticism, not only to recognize them, but to make the next book better? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're trying to do, is to create a context mm -hmm. uh, for a creativity. That's a terrible sentence, create a context for, con you know, what kind of writer am I? Uh, <laughs> you know, but I hope you get the idea. So, wh wh you know, what, what do you hope is going to happen in 10 years if you can sustain this? Right. So the, I, I wonder if the phrase you were looking for is republic of letters or what we really want maybe is an ecclesia of letters. But um, you're... I settle for an anarchy of letters. <laughs> as, as long as it's interesting Just, and yes. vital. <laughs> A jungle of letters, yes, that would be fine. Um, I, Dana, just your, what you were just saying there is reminding me of the scene you described earlier when we first met years ago at Notre Dame. And Dana, I'm sure, will not remember this, but we had had this long dinner that consisted of, of 
several deans at the University of Notre Dame talking for a long time. And Dana and I f got a few minutes to talk individually, and I was telling him about my pathetic efforts to hash out a few poems. And, and we talked for a while, and finally he looked at me, he gave me the card of this fellow he mentioned for the, who ran the conference, and he said, you shouldn't be working alone. And that, I think, is the phrase that both consciously and unconsciously has carried me forward over these last 20 years, building publications and building up a community both of artists and of readers that will be as broad as not just the church, but as broad as, as civilization itself is our, is our goal. Yeah, we're, we're in a society right now, American society right now, in which a young creative person feels that they cannot be a public Catholic. They, that if they cling to their faith and pursue their art, that the two things are in opposition. That is the cultural reality you know, we're hoping mm -hmm. to change, mm -hmm. you know, which is to make a, a context where people of faith can find the direction, the education, the support, and the recognition that, that they deserve as artists, and to you know, actually create a diversity in American mm -hmm. culture. The typical advice given to a Catholic artist or intellectual uh, in our day is to keep your head down and to try to go unnoticed so you can get a job. <laughs> and, you know, I've been blessed that uh, I'm sufficiently hard-headed and inept to certain social cues that I just, that was never going to work for me. <laughs> I was just going to plow through. Um, but I'm, I'm gr so glad I've been able to plow through because I've been able to create at least a small space where more people who know what they want to do and why it needs to be done for uh, the sake of our culture uh, feel comfortable speaking publicly. And I, I want to also pay tribute to your essay, The Catholic Writer Today, and the, some of the things that you've done very public witness as a Catholic artist and writer that it's allowed other people not just to whisper about maybe having these thoughts from time to time, but actually be willing to become uh, writers who are Catholic and in a, in a public fashion. Well, thank you. You've done such a good job answering my questions. Why don't we see if the audience has some questions? Uh, you want to... Uh, wherever the Father. microphone goes. Yeah. <laughs> Front row. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, without wanting to inflate your egos, I would think this is probably one of the most important sessions of this whole conference. And the reason uh, would be my question, in a sense, that I, I think many leaders in the church today have no sense that we're almost at the time of Paul and the Acts of the Apostles when he went to the Areopagus. Um, we're trying to communicate with a language that our young people especially don't understand at all. And the service of the arts, the good, the true, and the beautiful, must in some way bring people to God. The Catholic sociologist Stephen Bullivant has spoken of a, mm -hmm. a herd immunity to the gospel now, mm -hmm. certainly in the Western world. And I'm wondering, does the church, and I'm talking about people like me and collars and things, does the church really understand, for example, in the seminary, we didn't have any, <laughs> any study of music, the arts, literature, painting, anything. Do you think the, the church as an institution understands how important the service of the arts is to the proclamation of the gospel? J James, let me answer that with one syllable, then you do the rest. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a very good answer. I, I, uh, I, I, the, the challenge that we face is that the truth is a truism. It can't help but become a truism. And so, and truisms become platitudes. Um, I published a book in 2017 called The Vision of the Soul, Truth, Goodness, and Beauty in the Western Tradition, more or less to try to remind people of the Western tradition and the Christian tradition of metaphysics that puts beauty at the center of being. But I think it doesn't matter how many times I make that argument, there's a tendency for people to think the beautiful is a nice sentiment or a good feeling and therefore always incidental. But in fact, our encounters with beauty, Dana described them eloquently, they really are our incarnate encounters with the Logos. I mean, Catholic priests 
are overwhelmed with the mortgage, the mass schedule, the confession schedule, and everything else, they have no time for this. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen from the lay, the laity. You know, we have to do this. It's who's traditionally done it, despite mm -hmm. the Fra Angelicos and the Thomas Aquinas's of the world. There tend to be more exceptions. Uh, but the church tends to look on beauty as decorous mm -hmm. rather than essential. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have to, uh, this, I have an article in the current issue of First Things called Christianity and Poetry, which is about the fact that poetry, one third of, of scripture is written in poetry. So either God made a terrible editorial mistake <laughs> uh, or there's something that God, you know, that God and the prophets and the Virgin Mary and the evangelists are telling us about the types of language. So we have to recover beauty and recover our tradition. I don't think we can look to the, the clergy for, for, you know, if we're lucky, they won't obstruct us, you know, but, but they just don't have the time or the energy or the resources to do it. Um, and so I think it's gonna be, have to be us. This is, this is the great challenge of the moment is, is we, we so often feel we're in retreat and on defense that we wanna batten down the hatches and re-enter a fortress, whereas in fact now is the moment where we have to give birth to new things. We need to be joyful and confident, uh, you know, because you know, th that's what our, our faith and our culture gives us. And despite you know, whatever discrimination or you know, scarcity that we're facing, you know, that's what's going to bring people to us. I think there's a question for the fellow right behind you. So you, you have described Morton Lauritsen's music as having great authority. And so I wondered if you would both say something about what it means for a work of art to have authority such that it can call forth a truthful response from someone who, who may not themselves be well formed in or even particularly sympathetic to the arts. I think one of the characteristics of a masterpiece is in a sense to speak to you with such a completeness and uh, emotional authority that you meet it on equal terms. And it has the ability to transform you. I mean, entertainment gives you a predictable experience in a predictable way. You know, you're gonna go to a mystery, you want suspense, you're gonna do, you would, on a thrill ride, you wanna be scared. But what a, a work of art does is to provide an encounter uh, which is unpredictable. I think that's what the church makes the church a little nervous about art mm -hmm. sometimes too, because it can lead to, they would like something that brings you to, a, to one conclusion and one conclusion only. Would you like to read some verse? I, well, I, w I would. Uh, I've got to share a quick anecdote on that score though. Uh, the, Terry Eagleton, the literary critic, uh, has, has some good lines and one of them is after the 19th century when educators told everybody that exposure to humane letters would make everybody morally improved. And then, of course, the Americans came and liberated the death camps at the end of the Second World War and saw that Nazi soldiers were reading Goethe in their spare time. And I think Eagleton says, somebody had some explaining to do. We, you know, <laughs> we, you cannot count on uh, the arts to be edifying. What they are is, is portals onto being. They're portals onto what's real. And the human soul responds in very various ways to its encounters with reality, and not all of them are beautiful or salutary. But that's but. also the reason why, uh, this is one of the things I, I you know, Lauritsen is not Catholic, uh, he, uh, but, but he uses these great, you know, Catholic texts where the substance of the words, this setting of O Magnum Mysterium is, I mean, people, Listen to that, and, with, and I've seen this even with choirs that are performing his music. The choirs themselves go into trance states mm -hmm. when they're doing this. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what, you know, our society takes up every minute of your time. There's something that's disturbing you every minute. And to have the opportunity to be put into a state uh, that touches the deepest parts of you whose goal is unpredictable I think has enormous uh, spiritual energy in our culture today. And I think that that's he, the genius of his music is to create a mystical state mm -hmm. of heightened awareness. But let's, let's hear your poem. Yeah, that's, it was just trying to capture just that that led me to write uh, this, this, the last poem in The River of the Immaculate Conception, 
uh, whose title, as all the titles, in, are taken from the, uh, the score of Frank's mass, uh, Hasten to Aid Thy Fallen People. And this is about that mystery where the sacraments and the arts seem to interweave with one another and have a certain kinship. How does one make a song of holiness or speak of music without spoiling it? They both seem more than our tongues can confess and born above in our world do not fit. What's more, those who ascend with them are closed in on themselves, struck dumb, and all in ecstasy that they have heard seems flailing, foolish in a fallen word. But every rising strain must strain indeed to lend a form to what in truth is light and manifest peace as if it's a deed and give transcendence some arc of a flight. The purity of every saint will be daubed on with sloppy paint and what no thought may comprehend or say must be taught in the staging of a play. The gift of form because so fascinating as we bend down to work with knife or ruler reminds us that beyond it's always waiting some piercing light. Consider how the jeweler makes every cut upon a stone for its sake, but not that alone. His patient labor wasted if a line does not refract and multiply and shine. And any humble implement may serve to figure forth and yet conceal that light so that high thought is felt upon each nerve and mystery is given to our sight. Just this way, things are lifted up, a chalice wrought from wooden cup, a little dust and water mixed to clay are molded into birds that fly away. The mass is, his, is first his earthen sacrifice, but also taste of peace and heaven's throne, the gift that leaves behind all thought of price, yet where, no less, we raise a plangent groan. For at its finish, we are sent into the world both dark and bent, that bearing out the virgin's hastening aid from ruined choirs, some good may be remade. We have some, uh, we have any other questions? Uh, why don't we do the corner? I think you can get the microphone. I, I can barely see you through the lights, sorry. Hello. <laughs> My name is Francisco, I'm from Chile. Um, and I founded a nonprofit in Sacred Music. We have some videos on YouTube. Um, I experienced what you taught, uh, what you said in the talk. We have experienced that it goes directly, the music to the heart of people and uh, converts hearts and it's um, an, uh, been an amazing experience. So my question is, why if uh, Disney, for example, is expending $1 million per minute of video of their films, okay? Why we as Catholics are not doing such an investment in art or culture that, uh, that we know that is so important, you know? That's... That is the question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> as Hamlet said, yeah. uh, I mean, we... Uh, we don't have people involved in Catholic philanthropy that understand how central culture is. That with, unless we win the, the war of the imagination and creativity, nothing else is really gonna, going to last in terms of its social impact. Mm -hmm. we, we try to do that with our children. We, we teach them to, to, to kneel when they pray to bow their heads and pray before they eat. We, we fully understand that raising children involves uh, uh, habituating or teaching both the body and the soul. But for some reason, when we move beyond the microcosm of the family, many of our contemporaries become deaf mutes or just blind to uh, the lack of, that, of formation that they're giving to the very people that they want to help shape and, uh, and and to, to lead along to the common good. Yeah, once again, I think this is the challenge of the laity, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to fund these things, to take them seriously. You know, if you give a dollar to the church, it's gonna be spent, I think, largely for, for charity. 
because there's, that need is always there. It's always in the forefront of the clergy, and I don't think that they they can afford the luxury of understanding the centrality, the essential quality of the imagination. So I think that the, the, it really you know falls upon you know upon you know people who have done well in the world uh, to share it. There's something that strikes me as so important, and it goes back to sort of the first question that was asked. When Jesus spoke to the multitudes, he f essentially told stories, he gave maxims, you know, little sayings, and he gave poems, poems like the Beatitudes. And that's because he understood uh, that that's how humanity remembers things. You know, and, and when I was ta taught at USC, I remember, I, I, USC has more Catholics in the undergraduates than Notre Dame does. I had 210 people in my poetry class. I did uh, W.B. Yeats's The Lake Isle of Innisfree, which, uh, which, and I said, there's an allusion in this poem. We went through everything and there's an allusion. Does anybody know what the allusion is? I will arise and go then, and not anybody does. Well, it's from uh, the New Testament. Nobody do it. It's from uh, the Gospels. Nobody got it. Uh, it's from, and has anybody read the, the parable of the prodigal son? I had, of 200 students, about half of whom were Catholic, three people uh, who had claimed that they had heard the, the, prod the prodigal son. But only one of them said, well, is that where the, you know, is that about the guy, you know the bad kid that runs off? Yeah, so so I read them the whole parable, and I said, you know, why does he say, you know, when does the prodigal son I will say, well, I will arise and go? Then what does it say about Yates? Mm -hmm. But it, and it says something that you know, and then afterwards they they all come to me. That was a great story, you know, that they had never heard that story before, you know, and and the whole thing is that that's fine. We got to begin somewhere. Yes, it's a pretty good place to begin. Let's continue. But I think that we've lost the power of storytelling. Uh, yes. And it's so powerful. You know, we've lost the power of singing, of singing communally. You know, lost the power of the image. It, there's, someone once said to me, winsomeness is not gonna win people back to the church. But in, in a certain sense it is. If, if you can tell the story of our salvation and tell the story of our hope, people will see that it's better than what they find available on the menu of their lives. Uh, you know, our, the wills are defective and wayward, so you can't count on it to come soon. But if you're telling stories, eventually one story will be heard, and it will change somebody. Well, Oscar Wilde, who converted to Catholicism on his deathbed after delaying it, uh, you know, for 40 years disastrously, uh, said, man is hungry for beauty. There is a void. And I think our society is full of people that are starving. They've been, they're, they're given a junk you know, food diet of entertainment, but they're hungry for the true and the beautiful. And that seems to me the, the opportunity of the Catholic artist. It was another question, so we, you know, uh, how about this corner there? Um, Great, thank you. Let me just start by saying this has been fascinating and really stimulating. Um, I wanna ask a question about the role of both law and technology um, in the problems that you've been describing. Because um, at one point, you know, you had asked James a question about, you know, why are we in this mess? And he said, the 60s. And that got me thinking, you know, two things that take place in the 60s. It's not just the sexual revolution, but a whole series of bad Supreme Court cases um, with church-state relations, with pornography, with obscenity, a whole host of things with sexuality. And you can think of, you know, bad culture driving out good culture, the same way that bad charity drives out um, good charity. But also, so that's on the civil side. Ecclesially, you have the Second Vatican Council. Um, you would ask, you know, if you die, you could be declared a saint if good music comes back. What about the role of the Second Vatican Council's constitution on the sacred liturgy, um, Sacrosanctum Concilium, which, you know, the document's a lot better than the implementation. And, you know, Bugnini has a lot to blame for this. But um, the reason we got guitar masses and bongos and all the rest is because of a law, right? I mean, this was a, an ecclesial law, for lack of a better term. The reason we get the civil stuff is bad law coming out of the 60s. So that's, that's my question about the role of law here. Question of technology, think about Neil Postman amusing ourselves to death. The role of TV first, then the internet, and now these devices we all have in our pockets. Um, have they um, habituated ourselves to cheap, quick hits of entertainment 
and not beauty and culture and you know the stuff you guys are talking about. I mean, it just strikes me that both technology and law accounts for some of the problem. I'll give another one syllable thing and then you answer it. Yes. <laughs> That's, it's, a, it's a great question and it's, it's an intractable one because um, merely presenting to the world great art is not going to get the screen out of people's faces. Um, and so it's, we're dealing with a very thick, deep trouble. It, it, we wanted to avoid talking about policy this afternoon because there's so much of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say briefly, you know, my pet theory is that the normalization of, uh, of gay marriage in our culture does not come from any legal decision or, and it certainly doesn't come from the, that canard of, well, then I sat down and had an honest conversation. That was all propaganda. It comes from the proliferation of pornography in people's pockets from those phones. So I think that, that's done more to change people's attitudes, and th that's a massive problem that's going to have to be solved with public policy as well as moral revival and all kinds of other things. So th there's no universal simple solution to the cultural situation that we're in. What we do is we begin well. We commit ourselves to doing what we do well. Uh, to, you know, in terms of an artist creating, you know, uh, work of powerful originality, creativity of truth and beauty, and uh, it's going to be, you know, civilization is a constant conversation, a constant battle. It'll never be over. And but right now, what we need to do is, in a sense, to re-engage the imagination. And we're doing it in a very different world than existed 100 years ago. But that's, that's the reality. And, and, and uh, improvisation and change and uh, innovation will find ways of doing this. But, but unless we begin seriously and we begin with uh, you know, a kind of powerful commitment to understanding that experiential, intuitive, poetic language is the language which most of humanity uh, experiences their lives and thinks about their lives most of the time. That conceptual analytical thought is, is really a kind of specialized discourse. And that we're not in, uh, involved in the way that most people lead most of their lives most of the time. Mm -hmm. we, we had another question here. Aaron Cariotti, I'm a head shrink. Um, so James, thank you for the, Reading, Dan, I've had the pleasure of hearing you recite some of your own poetry several times. So before we wrap, I was just wondering if you would be willing to do uh, a bit of your own poetry as well. Sorry to put you on the spot, but. Um, d d indulge me. Uh, <laughs> this is a poem about art. It's a poem about most of the, mu of the works in most of museums were intended to be sacred works, and yet they're put in a secular context, which changes their meaning. This is a, a, a poem spoken by a, a statue, a Mexican statue in a museum that survived the Mexican Revolution. It's an angel that's been damaged. It's called The Angel with the Broken Wing. Let me hope I can remember it. I am the angel of the broken wing, the one large statue in this crowded room. The staff finds me too fierce. And so they shut faith's ardor in this air-conditioned tomb. The docents praise my elegant design above the murmur of the galleries. Perhaps I am a masterpiece of sorts, the perfect emblem of futility. Mendoza carved me for a country church. His name's forgotten now except by me. I stood beside a gilded altar where the hopeless offered God their misery. I heard the women whispering at my feet, prayers for the lost, the dying, and the dead. The candles stretched my shadows up the wall, and I became the hungers that they fed. I lost my left wing in the revolution. Even a saint can savor irony. The tro when troops were sent to vandalize the chapel, they hit me once, almost apologetically, because even the godless feel something in a church, a twinge of hope, fear, who knows what it is, a tremor, was it an ancient tremor that they can't dismiss. 
There is so much I must tell God. The howling of the damned can't reach that high, but I sit here like a dead thing nailed to a perch, a crippled saint before a painted sky. I, 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 I think I muffled one of the lines. That's, it was, it was, it wasn't your best performance, but I'm gonna, it'll do, it'll do for today. I wasn't um, prepared. I mean, Aaron yeah. puts me on the spot. <laughs> This, yeah, this, this, is, this is reminding me I while I... 35 out of 36 lines, that's <laughs> well, worth something. <laughs> while we have a moment, uh, as I said earlier, this is a, a moment to give birth to new things, to build up new institutions, to, re, to not merely to defend the old, but to make the old defensible by building new things. And among the, those institutions are the, the Master Fine Arts program that we talked about earlier, but also several small literary presses that I'm very proud to be associated with. My colleague Joshua Wren, uh, out of a fit of idealism and naivete, began a publishing house to feed his family because star working at Starbucks wasn't doing it. And, <laughs> and, um, and so he started a, a publishing firm uh, a decade ago now called Wise Blood Books. Uh, one of the first important publications of Wise Blood Books was a long essay by someone you may know called The Catholic Writer Today. Um, and, uh, and that put Wise Blood on the map. A few years later, the Franciscan University at Steubenville Press asked me to start an imprint called, which I called Coliseum Books that would publish new books of poetry and, and, and literary criticism. And so I'm very pleased to say that we have over here a generous sampling of Wise Blood books, including The Catholic Writer Today, Poetry is an Enchantment. Um, those of you who know the wonderfully literary president of Wyoming Catholic College, Glenn Arbery, his second novel. We have a couple copies here that was recently published by Wise Blood. Um, I don't know, well, I see some of my books, but uh, there's, there's a bunch of books here, and I hope uh, everyone who's here will, Just will take, take one take home. Take them, they're free. Yes. Price is right. Yes. <laughs> so, and let's try to create the culture we want to live in. Thank you so much.